morning, I pray that the entrance of your word will bring light, that it will bring understanding to the simple. God, that we shall leave this place better than we came. Lord, that I shall speak like the pen of a ready writer. God, that my mouth will utter only the word of God. Think through my mind. God, take away every distraction. I pray that your word will have a free course in every church. God, I ask that your will be done. I pray for Joe Cairo in Japan. Lord, bless him today. Cause your word to, to overwhelm him and be glorified. I pray for Helen. I pray for many people that are watching via live streaming. I ask that you bless them. I pray for every church connected this afternoon. God, meet everybody at the point of their need. Not my will, but yours be done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 2 while you remain standing in honor of the word of God. Nobody sitting down. If you are grateful for your, light, for your legs, you are grateful for your back, you are grateful for the health God has given you, stand on your feet. If you are not sick and you are sitting down, you are a lazy butt, and I don't take lazy people, so stand. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 2. I welcome those of you who are coming here for the very first time. I pray that the Lord will meet you as you come to his presence. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to read from verse 21. I want you to take note, notice or note of verse 22 to 23, verse 27, 39, 40, 41, 42. These are verses that speak to the life of Jesus, the life of Mary and all of that. I want you to see the traditions they, they observed and all that. Verse 21. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Verse 22, look into your Bible. Now when the days of our purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it, came to, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus, look at that, to do him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you had prepared before the face of all peoples. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of men in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul and the thoughts of many hearts may, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Verse 36. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Hanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow about of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. I want you to know that the child grew like a normal child and became strong. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. Note that his parents went every, to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it. But supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey, and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, seeking him. Now so it was that after three days, that they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed 
And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Verse 51. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them and was subject to them and was in submission to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. Let's read verse 52 together. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. One more verse and I'll let you sit down. Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs 22. Verse 6, almost all of us have heard this scripture or know it, but I want us to see it together. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Are you there? Let's read it together. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Today we are discussing... The early life or the early years of Jesus. We're going to be looking at his early years up to his baptism just before he started his three-year ministry. I want you to know that Jesus came from a town called Bethlehem. Do you, do you know that by now? He came from a town called Bethlehem from one of the cities of Judah. Micah chapter 5 verse 2, put it up there. Micah 5 verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. We have dissected this verse frame by frame. But I just wanted us again to establish the fact that Jesus Christ came from Bethlehem, Ephrathah, and from one of the cities of Judah. Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. Matthew 2, 6. Thank you. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Amen? So Jesus Christ came from Bethlehem. I'm giving you this as some background of his coming. He came from a humble background. I want you to know that Jesus' parents were ordinary people. They were an ordinary set of young people who were about to enter an ordinary marriage and have ordinary children, an ordinary life, an ordinary life until the son they were to born or to give birth to change everything. If Jesus hadn't been born by them, they would have, no, we wouldn't be reading about them. So he was, an, he was a special child. He was a child that was bigger than both of his parents. And because of that child, their trajectory changed. I don't know about you, but when you were born, have you changed anything in your parents' lives? Has your coming into your mother and father's life added any value to them? I'm not preaching yet. I'm just asking a question. Because I, I don't know about you, but I am determined not to just be an ordinary child. Because Jesus was not one. And if this extraordinary Jesus is in you, then you have become an extraordinary person and must do extraordinary things. Somebody say amen. amen. I want to also ask another question. If you knew that the child you have or the children you have are not ordinary, would that affect how you treat them? Would you start looking at them differently? Well, I want to bring news to you this morning that there is no child that passed through your birth canal that is ordinary and that they came here for a purpose. They came here for a reason and that you have a responsibility to guide and tell and, and, and train them to fulfill that destiny. I make bold to say that if it had not been for my mother, I probably would not be standing here. So Jesus came from that background of ordinary. Though he came from a little town, however, he came by prophecy. He came by prophecy. Nothing about him was ordinary. And I want to say this morning that you may come, you might have come from a very small place. I pray you came by prophecy. I came, you came, I pray you came by expectation that you were a prayer answered, a prayer for a mother. That you came there, though ordinary, you came by a conviction. And a prophecy to your mother or your father that this child is a blessed child. I don't know about you, but I'm not an ordinary child. And I'm saying that to stir up your heart today to stop living ordinary. Stop thinking ordinary. Stop living like you're just nothing, like you're just passing down here. That you begin to live like somebody with a purpose. 
Hallelujah. His father was a carpenter and his mother was a housewife. And one of her mission, her only mission was to be a good housewife and a good mother. Now I know that this is 2016 and boys and women and men have degrees who are doing the same work. But whether it is 3016 or 4016, this word of God will not change. This word abides forever. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall remain forever. I want to make bold today that no matter who you are as a woman, no matter how many degrees you have, your most noblest thing is to take care of your husband and make sure you raise giants for God. Anything short of that, be Isaba. Anything less than that is nothing. And let me start. I don't know how this second service is going to go. I'm trying to finish on time. <laughs> but let me just be adding some things as we are going. That when your life is said and done, after you have finished going up and down, London, New York, here and there, you come back. When you are going to measure your life, it will not be by how many houses you built. It will not be by how much money is in the bank account. It will not be by how many degrees you've accrued. It will be when you look at your children, that will be your report card. I want to plead with some of you right now to help your parents change the scores. Change the scores. Change. Whereas your parents are going to end as a nobody, do something that lifts up your parents. Let them say, wow, did you, do you know this person's child built that thing? Do you know this person's child schooled that person? Do you know this person's child built this bridge? You would have changed the trajectory of your parents. Give God some praise. Jesus was from an ordinary family, but you and I know that he was from the royal family. He came, his blood was blue. He came from the, from the house of, from Solomon, David, and Abraham. He was royal. But he did not wear that as a cloak to boast. He was humble. We'll talk about that some other time. But I wanted to say to somebody sitting here this morning, that you may be living in a one-room house somewhere. You may be squatting with somebody. You may even be a house help. That is not your destiny. You are still royalty. Because if you are in Christ Jesus, the Bible says you are a royal priesthood, a peculiar person, God's holy nation. So you are a special person. Where you are, what you wear, how you are living right now is not the definition of who you are. Who you are is in the spirit. And you, begin, you need to begin to know who you are in the spirit and begin to walk around like a prince and a princess. Because that is who we are. So Jesus knew all those things, but he took it easy and he just, he was looking at people, not respecting him and all, but he knew where he came from. He knew his roots. I don't know if you know your roots. I know who I am. I know whose I am. I know what I'm here to do and I know what I'm going to do. So I'm not an ordinary person. I refuse to be ordinary. I refuse to be nothing. I refuse to be small. In this, my life, I will not be small. And so I challenge you not to, not to just continue the way you are. I want you to make a little shift and begin to say, you know what? I'm bigger than this. I'm better than this. I'm more than this. Somebody say amen. amen. Jesus came from such a small village that one of his to-be disciples asked a question. He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? How many of you remember that? In John chapter 1, let's look at it in the scripture so you don't think I'm just making it up. John chapter 1 verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. 46. 46. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Come and see. When they come to see, will they see anything around you? Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no deceit. And so before he even saw the Jesus, Jesus was already beginning to tell him. So that by Jesus, by, by seeing Jesus and hearing Jesus, he knew that something spectacular had come out of Nazareth. Can something good ever come out from your compound, Newi? Can anything good come out from Ege? Can anything go, good come out from Ikode Kene? Can anything good, can anything come from your clan? Can anything good come from Kurdan? 
I want to challenge you this morning to be that good thing that has come out of your clan. To stand out so that nobody can debate it. That when they look at you and they, they hear your voice, they will say, I thought this was Jagaba's son. Because of you. Some of you are sitting down here now. You are prostitutes. That is not who you are. That is not, you are a daughter of a, you are my sister for crying out loud. You are not, you are not, you are not a dumping ground for every man to put his trash in you. You are created in the image of God Almighty. You are the daughter, the seed of Abraham, the daughter of Sarah. Come on. Yes. Something good can come out from where you came from. I came to challenge you this morning that you were created to break that thing. That ordinary, that is, that has described your people. Jesus was brought up by both parents and by both parents. Jesus had a father and a mother present at young age. And both of them were involved in his upbringing. I know we live in a, in a day and age whereby we are all competing with one another. Okay, he has a Mercedes Benz, I have to buy a bigger one. Okay, he lives in this estate, I have to go to the bigger estate. And so we are carried away. Men are crisscrossing. Sometimes you, as a man, you meet yourself on the gate. You meet yourself, you are just coming back from Beijing. And then I should stop at the gate say, but I'm on my way to Lagos. It, look, it looks like one person, but it's actually two people because your life is too complicated. So you are there trying to get your children a bigger house, a big car, a good education, and and the children are falling apart. But I want to make a bold to say that Joseph was involved in the life of Jesus. Joseph was in Jesus' everyday life. Joseph took the assignment of Jesus seriously. Joseph was a very godly, humble, obedient man. He was not stubborn or proud. Whatever God told him to do through the angels, he did. He was attentive to what he saw, heard, or dreamed. He was a man led by the Spirit. I want you to know that Joseph watched after Jesus diligently. Wherever God told him to take Jesus to, he took him. Whatever God told him to do with Jesus, he did. He really took good care of Jesus and protected him. Go to Egypt, he moves. Go back, he goes back and he sees another man who looks like he moves him again. He was involved. He was hands-on on Jesus. These days, men, you are too busy. When was the last time you sat down with your son as a man and just communed with him and taught him some things and took of what is your essence and put in him? When I listen to my son speak, worthy, I can tell you that pastor must have breathed something in that boy because he is so kind and so gentle. It's not natural. Worthy is extremely kind. And he used to cry a lot as a baby. And pastor would put him on his back and pray in the spirit and hold him and rock him. He used to just speak into his life. And if pastor were alive today, I am sure Worthy would be sitting down here and doing what pastor was doing. Because you did not just bring boys out to prove that me too, I have sons. You brought sons here to craft them and direct them into their destiny. I came this morning to challenge every man to be involved in the, up, in the daily upbringing of your children. Don't say, go to your mother. Go to your mother. Watch TV. TV has become father to some people. Watch cartoon. And so whatever cartoon is pumping, your children are swallowing. Because you, that, is, that you have decided, you have relegated your responsibility to the TV or to the house help. But I want you to know that Joseph was involved in the life of Jesus. He was intensely involved because he had had, he came by prophecy and it was to Joseph's credit and whatever to ensure that those prophecies came to pass. I know that when we, we adopted Worthy, it was by choice and we were determined that God's purpose would be fulfilled in his life. When we brought him from the hospital, this building was not built, nothing. It was just a wall and dirt. I remember we brought him and stood here with Dr. Nana and whoever, Auntie Reggie. We lifted him up to the Lord. And it has been my responsibility just to keep telling him, you are going to preach the gospel. You are a child of God. And I'm talking to him. I'm giving him books to read on men. And thank God, Pastor Funcho has adopted him. It's like his father. He just loves Pastor Funcho. Pastor Funcho, the day worthy, when I told worthy you were sick, my sons, you just, just changed. 
Fear gripped him. But I thank God you are here. Takes him out. Buy stuff for him. Does things for him. They, every weekend, they are out together. And you know, we need that ministry in this church. There are many single women who need healthy men. Not men that will come around their house to take advantage of them. But men that will come and train these boys, take them out, play ball with them, teach them a few things, teach them about puberty, teach them about how when their little thing shoots up, what to do to bring it down. You need to show them. We need men like that. Not men that will come and try to sleep with their, ba their, their mothers or their sisters. But if you can't do other people's children, take care of your own one son. That, is my, the, that one you must do. I want you to know that Joseph was involved in the life of Jesus. But more than Joseph was Mary, his mother. For Mary was a godly woman. She was humble, intelligent. She had a lot of word. She was also a believer. Remember whatever the angel said, he said, I believe, be it unto me according to your word. So she believed, never argued. And when she understood whatever God required of her, she did it. She was a woman of the word. You say, Pastor, how do you know? Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1 and I'll show you. Luke chapter 1. Don't put it up on the board. I want you to look at it in, the, in your Bible. I'm going to train you to love your Bible. I hope you already love it. Good. So when the angel comes and tells Mary she's going to have the child, hear what she says in verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. See, she had learned, she had read the Psalms and saw how David would praise and worship God. And she goes, my spirit has rejoiced in my God and Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of, my, of his maidservant, that is humility. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. You see, once in a while you just need to just brag a little bit. Alone. Say henceforth, they will call me care group leader. They will call me pastor. They will call me Kish's wife. You just need to brag a little about some things. Because you know that if it hadn't been God, it would be another story. And so she says, henceforth they will call me blessed. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the, in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones. These are scriptures. These are scriptures. Because if you go to say God brings down one and he lifts up one and puts down the other. So these are scriptures she's quoting. He has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. See, she was a woman of the word. Commentaries have it that Jesus was greatly affected by his mother. She taught him a lot of the Torah and directed him in the way he should go. It was Mary who had everything the angel had said to everybody. It was she who had what Zechariah said, what, what Elizabeth said, what the, uh, Simeon said and all. The Bible says she's put everything in her heart. And so she began to direct that boy. My mind, my, my mind tells me that when Joseph was done, she would call him by the side and also say this about him. And so the two of them were deeply involved in the training and upbringing of Jesus Christ. I'm going to discipline myself to stand here. So he was taught... Jesus had a strict Jewish upbringing. Just like we should say of your children, he had a, they, they, his children have a strict Christian upbringing. Can I say that about you, about your children? That they have a strict, a strict Christian upbringing. That your children know what to eat, what not to eat, what to watch, what not to watch, where to go, where not to go, who to befriend, who not to befriend. Do your children know that? Do your children know that it's time for church, it's time for devotions, it's time, it's time to give? Do your children know about tithing and offering? Do your children know about evangelism? Do your children know about reading the Bible for themselves? Jesus had a strict Jewish upbringing. That was why by the time he was eight days old, they took him to church to circumcise him and they named him. And when Mary's um, time for giving birth had passed, her blood flowed after her birth, all those things that go with that Jewish thing. When it had finished, the Bible said they took him and dedicated him to the Lord. So they did everything according to the law. He was brought up properly. They did not jump or skip anything. And see, these are the kinds of parents God will entrust some people to. Parents who are careful. Parents like my mother. 
My mother started being a Christian. I used to tell people that my mother was a professional Christian. The only thing my mother did was Christianity. Everything else was just to support Christianity from when she was a child. My mother them were giving first fruits when they were children. When their pigs would give birth, they would take the first one to the pastor and give it to them. So my mother lived like that. My mother gave tithes and offerings. And my mother made sure in the equa she knew, she brought us strictly, strict equa upbringing. It blows my mind sometimes to hear people say they grew up and never went to church. Their parents didn't take them to church. So where did they take you? They took Jesus to church every Sabbath. They took him to the yearly feast in Jerusalem, the Passover. Where do you think Jesus got the habit of going to church from? His parents. For the Bible says if you train him in the way he should go, when it is... That... Can I tell you the truth? I go to visit blessings sometimes in America. And on Sunday, I don't feel like going to church. You say, mommy, be sleeping. I'm going to church. Because when I travel, I just want to rest from church because church is my work. My child will dress and go up and come back and meet me. In the evening, she's going for her day. I have trained her. They, she, they are, so when they grow up, they will not depart from it. She had, by the time he was 12, they took him to that place and he met the elders. And the things he had learned from home he was not talking to those elders as God. He was talking to them as man. But as man trained by parents. When he asked questions, they couldn't answer. They looked at him and marveled. Which can be this? <laughs> there are some children in Nigeria today, when they speak scriptures, you might, your mouth will open. Because their parents have decided you will know this Bible. Now, some for sure, but... <laughs> Paul said, whether it's for sure or for real, at least Jesus Christ is preached. I, the Bible doesn't say it, but I believe and I know that when Jesus Christ was 13 years old, he became a bar mitzvah, and he did bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah is both, is both a noun and a verb. It is something that happens when a Jewish child turns 13. He would have read the, script, the, the Torah and memorized it. And now he goes and says it, and he is initiated now as a man. The bar mitzvah means son of commandment, meaning that he has the word. And they do a ceremony for that, to that person so that you pass into that. And the ceremony of bar mitzvah is done, and you can now be said to be a man. You can take decisions by yourself, and you can take responsibility of your actions. You can make decisions. I believe Jesus went through that because he observed every jot and iota of the law. That was why he said, I did not come to condemn it. I came to fulfill it. By the time Jesus finished, nobody could accuse him of saying, you are a lawless person. They knew he had kept strictly the law. Question is, what have you, some of you are here, you have not even paid your wife's, you have not paid your wife's dowry. True. And so you can never have, you are there, you are not really happy because there are certain rights you have not fulfilled. Some of you, you did not, you were not dedicated to God. True. Some of you need to ask your parents, was I ever taken to church and given to God? If not, bring yourself and say, God, I have given myself to you. <laughs> I'm not playing. Because some things will be following, you'll be wondering. See, after I, they took Jesus and handed him over to God. Have you handed all your children over to God, especially that first one? You see, about your first son, eh, you must make trouble with him. No matter what, let him finish it. Tell him, you belong to God, you have to do God's work. I gave you to God, you are sadaka, you are offering to God. You are tight, you are first fruit, you are offering to God. So you have to sort it out, you need to serve God. That's what the Bible says. Your son belongs to God. Now, I know these days we want our children to go to Ivy League universities. We want them to, to win the Nobel, Nobel Prize. We would be so proud to see our children in the UN. <laughs> Say, now my picking be that. That's my child. But you know, they can do all these things. And if they don't have God, they are nothing. And so you have all these accolades. And before God, you are zero. I refuse for that to happen. 
Jesus was properly brought up. They dotted every I on him and crossed him. I want you to know that a good foundation is important. The Bible says if you train a child in the way he should go, when he grows, he will not forget. Train him. It's a promise and it's an instruction. Train the child. Train him. So what is training? To train up a child is more than telling. Training includes teaching, helping, showing by example, and getting the trainee to participate. To train a child in the way he should go, you as the parent must go in the way you should go. Did you understand that? Before you can train your child to do what you want him to do, you must do what you ought to do. If you tell your child, go to church, you must go to church. You can't be watching TV on Friday and say, go to prayer meeting. Follow your mother and go to prayer meeting right now. If you don't go to prayer meeting, I'll be, the child will go to prayer meeting, but he's saying, stupid man, hypocrite like you. I will go now, but what about you? He is cursing you in his heart. I like um, that uh, Eliza Doolittle song. He said, don't, uh, 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 uh. don't tell me about love. Don't speak about love. He just say, show me. Do you know that song? I used to watch that movie every time I left church. Your child doesn't want you to tell him about God. Show me God. Your child doesn't want you to tell him about Bible. Read the Bible. Let me see. Your child doesn't want you to. Bad dog on trenchy. And can I tell you something about your children? They know you are a civil servant. They can Google and see your salary. <laughs> they know what your salary. They know computer more than you. So when your child looks at your house or houses and he looks at your salary and looks at your car and he looks at the school you are sending him, he will not say anything. But in his mind, he talks it somewhere. Because he doesn't add up. So you tell your child, it's bad to have sex outside of marriage. But in your room, you have a stack of pornography that you and your wife, you say, after all, we're adults. No, you have brought demon spirits into your house. Every pornographic thing in your house is demon spirit. Because those are people loaded with demons doing demonic things. By the time five people are having sex with one person, it's demonic. And so you are watching that say, I want to learn how to do love with my wife. First, you have brought, love, you have brought demons to your children. And they will enter your children. I'm not kidding. When Adam, and Eve, when Adam saw Eve, which, which was the film they watch? <laughs> do you know the name of the film they watch? Did they do it or they didn't do it? Did they do it? Open your mouth. I am saying that to say that you need to remove the demons in your house because you are hurting your children. When you are not there, they sneak in and look at them. And if they don't watch your own, they will go and Google. In the, oh, it's okay now. Daddy is watching. Anything daddy does is good. You need to know that, that you are your son's hero. And as a mother, you are, a son, you are your daughter's heroine. That is why when your skirt is here, this will be here. After all, she's mommy. Me, I'm a little younger, so my own can be here. So two of you are walking around like this, and I'm wondering... Your, with your short short skirt and your heels are like this so you are there as if something is worrying you <laughs> and then you finish you pray in tongues she's wondering this one and those film and that thing in the fridge and the short short clothes is that what Christians are supposed maybe I don't know since my mother says it, that's okay and so we have this rickety shaky flaky children who don't know God because we did not present to them the real God I make bold to say today that the parents of Jesus Christ showed them the real Jesus. They showed them the real God. They showed him. To train a child in the way he should go, you must be in the way you should go. So you, if you want your children to be, give, to be givers, you must give. I have noticed that my children are giving now more than me and it's scaring me. If you give them one million naira, my children will give away five. I'm like, no, save it. They are like, mommy, you don't save your own. So why are you telling us to save? That's the truth. Favor works. She just, 
my money is going. I'm like, no, this money, you can get an impress to do your work. You say, mommy, it's okay, I'll spend my money. Because that's what they see me do. Your children are not doing what you are telling them. They are doing what you are doing. Question is, are you doing the right thing? Things to make you go, mm. -hmm. <laughs> Training involves direct, direct, directing growth. The purpose is to make the person you are training proficient. So they wanted their children, they wanted Jesus to be a, profi a proficient Jewish boy. They wanted him to, be, he was going to be the savior. So everything was to train him towards that. The goal of every training must be to make the person proficient. So they dedicated him to Jesus, to, the, to God. They circumcised him. And um, he, oh, Jesus lived a, a normal life, but he did not sin as a child because he came to crush sin. By the time Jesus Christ is 12 years old, he could hold a conversation with grown-up people, but not in pride. These days, you know one small thing. You say, I beg, I beg, I beg, I beg. No, tell me that Bible. Me, my Sabiri, that. Jesus read it, but he was calm. He was not proud. Now, the last verse there says, now, um, he says, and Jesus increased. Then he went down with them, verse 51, and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Jesus, although Jesus knew all he knew, although he came by prophecy, the Bible says he went back and subjected himself to his parents. You know why? Because his parents trained him. I don't know about what is happening in this age, oh, where you will talk, your, your child will talk back. I don't understand it. He said, Pastor, we need to allow them to express themselves. Me, I will slap you until you see. I talk, you talk. You are taller than me. I will wait when you sit down and you are forgotten. And you are sitting down. I will go and give you goop. No, no, Pam. This one, you know this dangerous, just do doom. It will enter, it will go from your head to your neck, enter and settle in your heart. You will feel it here and all through your legs. The next time when I talk, you will say, yes, ma. My mother used to say, come on. When she said that, come on, now, that, I think it was supposed to be come on. My mother is come on. That come on meant you are supposed to wake up and go to school. Come on. You, you just go. Once you hear come on, you just take charge and turn around and begin to do the right thing. Wake up and say you are not going to church. She just comes out. Come on. No preaching, you know it's good to go to church. You know, if you go to church, God will, no, 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 no. One word, what was it? Come on. Come on. These days you come to church and leave your children at home. <laughs> My mother, actually, you went in front. She followed you. She was the last to leave home. Because my mother had the capacity to go to your bed and turn the bed down. She could literally lift the mattress and roll you down and then walk out. By that action, you know the next thing. It, it either meant go to school or clean or sweep or go to church. But anything, she, you just knew. And sometimes she just didn't say much. She would just follow you and just step on your, back, on your, on your shoe. This is, you be hearing children, cha -cha 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 -cha. and the parents say, yeah, Junior, you know, you know mommy loves you. No, sometimes the child is saying, mommy, slap me, please, I beg you, slap me. You're saying, you know, Junior, give the boy a tie, he will keep quiet. <laughs> no, uh, have you ever noticed, a child will be worrying you, worrying you, worrying you, when you give him ta, he will calm down. The Bible says there is foolishness in nature, but the one slap or one knock will drive the demons away. Too much talking does not drive demons. It makes demons act more. When you give him ta, demons will go, and you will live happily ever after. Now, I'm not talking about you go and beat your children and take out your frustration on your child. No. I'm talking about a slap that just corrects him. And then when he keeps quiet, now you hug him.
Come on. <laughs> Jesus was in submission. Until, so from after 12 years, we don't hear anything about him until he's 30. What is happening? He was just being a good old Jewish boy, doing what everybody was doing. Helping his parents, going to the synagogue, doing whatever, until at the age of 30. When the age of 30 came, because he had been in submission, then he went to be baptized. Because the baptism was supposed to usher him into his work. And having done everything, having dotted every I and crossed every T, he now went for baptism. And as he entered that water and came out, the Bible says that a dove came down upon him. And a voice, the dove is the sign of the Holy Spirit. And the voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. God aff affirmed him. From that baptism, the Bible says he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. That is where I'm going to stop with the life of Jesus. So what are the lessons I want you to learn today? With the little time I have, or I don't have. Your background is important. Whether you are from a rich background or from a poor background, you, are, you can use it as a springboard to worship God. But what I have found out the most in life is that people who come from a disadvantaged background end up doing great things for God. They overcome it. There are so many people who came from noble backgrounds, they don't end well because they take what they have for granted. I want to challenge you this morning that your background has happened. Your future hasn't happened. However, if you do not use your background well, it will jeopardize your future. I refuse to allow where I am coming from to disturb my destiny. If anything, where I am coming from is going to make me have a better future for myself. If your parents were rich, you need to work harder to dwarf their wealth. You need to do whatever was done before more so you can have a better future. Now, no matter what anybody says about you does not matter. What God says about you is what matters. And God says, before I formed you, I knew you. I called you by name. You are mine. You are not an ordinary person. One of my passions in life is to tell people you can make it. And I don't say that as a cliche. I say it because I know it's the truth. If you will just stand up and do a little, God will help you. Because God loves you. God wants you to be great. That you may have started wrong, but you can. Your takeoff might have been faulty, but your landing can be perfect. You might not have started well, but you can end well. You might have met the wrong people in the past, but they are not waiting for you in your future. All your wrong people are in your past. The better people are ahead of you. Your worst part is behind you. The best days of your life are, are ahead of you. Me, I know that my prettiest days are ahead of me. I'm not going to be always this fat. I know I'm going to slim down. I know I'm going to be more beautiful. I know I'm going to laugh some more. I know I'm going to find love. It may not be a man's love, but I'm going to love and be loved. So my best days are ahead of me. I haven't done anything for God. I'm going to do greater things for God. For God. I'm going to build bigger buildings. I'm going to impact more people. That is my future. I can't do anything about my past, but I know that my future is redeemed. Does anybody believe that? Clap unto the Lord. If you believe your future is better, clap unto the Lord. If you know you will not always be like this, clap unto the Lord. If you know you're going to be better, bigger, brighter, clap unto the Lord. If you know that through you, families of the earth will be blessed, clap unto the Lord. If you know that you are a generational thinker, one who will change the trajectory of people in their lives, shout unto the Lord. Tell your neighbor, I refuse to be small. I refuse to be ordinary. I refuse to be ordinary. People will read about me. People will know me. People will feel me. I will change my world. Shout unto the Lord. This is not preaching. It's the truth. Who told you you have lived in your best house yet? Who told you you have driven your best car yet? Who told you you have seen the destiny of your children yet? Wait until you see your children. I don't know about you. A day is going to come when I will sit down and look at my spiritual children and earthly children. And I will be called blessed. <laughs> Prove somebody wrong. They say, can anything good come from Kudan? Say, see me. Can anything good come from that care group? You will see. see you, under my leadership, you will see. 
Can anything good come out from that worship team? Our best days are ahead of us. Can anything good come from the care group system? Wait until you see us. Because our God has not even started with us yet. I'm not preaching. I'm telling you the truth. Brother Ilona, your best days are ahead of you. There is no question about it. Good, better, best. May I never rest until my good is better. <laughs> Clap for yourself. <laughs> Family is important. Parenting is so important. Woman, I know you don't like it when I say this. Because I know you need to wear your shoes and carry your briefcase in the morning and go out. That is not your best life. That is your secondary life. That is your inferior life. Your best life is when you're at home saying, Junior, what did you just say? Don't say that. I love you. You look wonderful. Have you done your room? Great. Let me see. That is your best you. You think that when you go to the office and come back and you are a doctor, missus, and you are this, that that is, that is not it. Your report card is your children. <laughs> Wahala day. Godliness is the greatest legacy you can give your children. Not money in an account. Serving God is better than winning Nobel Prizes. Know your children. Know, their, know what they are doing. Come with them to church. Discuss church with them. Jesus performed every... Some of you need to bring your firstborn. He's 30 years old and say, I want to dedicate you to the Lord. I didn't do it. I was stupid when I gave birth to you. <laughs> bring him. I, I'm looking forward to days when I will see adults. Here, I'm dedicating this one to God. He will kick and turn and say, see, this is, now I know. And when I carry your 17-year-old and say, come, he will be kicking and say, come. Say, who are we dedicating this one? It's the truth. Hmm? You dedicated an 18 year last year. See, I was speaking by the Holy by the Holy Ghost. Who told you I'm not a powerful woman of God? I I didn't even know that I, I was that powerful. Now I just know. Maybe you want signs and miracles. <laughs> you people fall now. <laughs> bring your children to church. Once in a while, just bring your children to me. Let me lay my hands on them. Now, don't, don't stress me, okay? Look, gauge the situation. But the Bible says they brought the little children to Jesus and he blessed them. And I love it. Every Sunday when I finish, they all rush to me. No matter who I'm talking to, they just come and push and just come and hold me. And I love it. There is something I release on them. Take them to your pastors. This trip say, bless my child. They can never collect more ble enough blessings. Name your children well. My money has come. Chuku goes, yay, money. You say, what is the meaning? Say, my money has come. <laughs> Nonsense. Is your life only money? He say, Ola wale, money has come. My wealth has come. What wealth? Is your life all about money? See how God named his son. Jesus. He will save their people from their sin. Yes. And then you are naming your own. Money. Alexander the Great. Because when, whatever name you give your children, you're prophesying into them. So when my mother birthed me, she called me Sarah. Princess with God. Um, do I look like a princess or what? When Pastor Ina and I were looking for a name for worthy, for days, nights, we will call king. We, it was not good enough. One day, from nowhere, pastor just said, worthy. 
He's worthy to be loved. He's worthy to be celebrated. He's worthy to be in this family. He's worthy to be a son. And so when he calls, when you call that name, he knows he's worthy. One day, what he said to me, Mommy, give me my money so that I can also be giving to people like you give people money. <laughs> because one day I will also be president. That is worthy. Don't call your name nonsense names. No, you say, what is the name of the child? I don't know. What? You have taken away his destiny. Because the Bible says, as Adam named the animal, so was its name. Meaning that the name is what you will do. Yes. That's why I gave myself in Kechi. <laughs> meaning I am God. And there's nothing you can do about it. Think about it when you, naming your child is a serious matter. Blessing and favor, we took months. I used to be in the bathroom with blessing my stomach. I'll be praying, Father, give me the name. One day I just felt that blessing. And then Pastor added her, his mother's name, Ochanya, queen among women. And she stands out. And then favor. We were expecting a boy, so we didn't have a name for her. So when she came, we began to think. One day we just say favor. I didn't want an ordinary name before everybody became favor. <laughs> if you look at many favors, they are younger than this are favor. Because people, yeah, unworthy too. Every, many worthies are younger than this. People just copy names. I don't copy. We said favor. What must be her middle name? Elizabeth. Favor Elizabeth. The favor of God is upon her. Anybody who sees favor and doesn't love her, that person is a winch. She is such a favorable girl. True or false? Those of you who know her. If you have a nonsense name, change it. If your name is Death, in my language, the name people, Dizot. Do you know what Dizot is? Poverty. So maybe poverty was happening around. Then they looked at you and decided you are the one that will carry that burden till you die. Finally, talking about submission, Jesus was submissive. It is in submission that you get the favor of God. It is in the submission that you get a blessing. If you do not submit, you will not get blessing. I hate it when people just leave jobs. I resign. I resign. And so nobody is placing their hands and blessing you. Because you are so arrogant. I have taught you in this church. That never leave a place of work without a blessing. Say to your boss, please bless me. Blessings are so important. So when the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus out of the water, the voice came and God said, this is my son. So anywhere he went, he had the blessing of the Lord upon his head. When you are marrying, make sure your parents bless you. Make sure your pastors bless you. Make sure your care group, your common, according to you, common care group leader blesses you. Because he watches over your soul. Marry. Say me. She can't tell me anything. I know people who, when they say, ah, pastor, I can't believe you. You've blessed my life. When I say don't marry that person, they'll pack their load and go and say, no, I'll marry. God has told me. God has jumped me and told you. Oh, yeah, go now. The marriage, you will go and I just say, go. You are in trouble. And that is why some of you are suffering today. Because they tell you, don't marry. You say, I'm going. And, and now you are inside it. You can't come out. Because it is nagadrum. You know they come out for marriage. So you need to go and repent and say, Father, please forgive me. Bless me. You want to start a church? Because we just anointed you on Friday. So to, now you are a man of God. So the next thing is you want to go and open a church. Go. Go. You know five scriptures. You say, after all, the spirit of the Lord. Me too, I understand that. Don't say that. Go, go. No long throwing you now. Some of you are um, apprentice. You go to a workshop, mechanical shop. After you fix two shop, two cars, you go and open your own. That's why you are spoiling people's car every day. <laughs> Everybody's a consultant. 
Okay. No, 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 no. I was just joking. I was just joking. I was just joking. I was just joking. You go, you are in a job, you make your first one million, you resign. You go and carry a briefcase, make five, uh, like Uncle Boss said, five different complimentary cards. You are chief executive officer. Your whole life is in that briefcase. Because you will not stay under somebody and learn. Jesus Christ was quiet for 18 years. For 18 years learning submission. And so when he came out in three years, he did what nobody has ever done. You are not a fool for staying in one place for years. The Bible says the faithful man will abound with blessings. Women, obey your husband. Say, eh, eh, pastor, now, now you talk. A submissive wife is a woman, is a beautiful woman. It's not when your husband say one, you will say 50. He said, ah, 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 please, 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 please. When men are talking, don't put your mouth. Keep quiet. You don't finish, you. You don't be woman. You be disgrace. Say, Pastor, preach. Pastor, don't move from there. Tell her some more. No, I'm not talking about you, the monster husband, who does not do anything good except to criticize and, and follow other women. Stand up, let's go home before we beat one another.